pleasure to be here this evening. Thank you, Matt, for organizing. Thanks, everybody, for having me. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, two technologies uh, tonight. Hopefully, uh, it'll be visually entertaining. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about 3D scanning and 3D visualization, which are the two uh, fields in which uh, my business, Floored, operates. Um, Floored's a, about a 45-person company. Uh, we're about two years old. Uh, we're right on the corner, actually, on the west side of uh, 25th Street. And, uh, and we're excited to show you guys some hardware tonight. Some of this hardware we actually haven't really shown publicly before. So um, this will be a fun chance for me uh, to see how it is received. Um, so we're a unique bird of a company in that we tend to make hardware for ourselves um, to apply in our own processes to make ourselves go faster, to increase our speed, to increase our, our profit. And then we look to see if, um, if there are markets for those hardware once we've sort of refined those processes. To date, we have not sold a piece of hardware to, uh, to any outside company, but, uh, but we're getting closer to those steps. Um, and what I think I'm going to do tonight is, uh, is show you a little bit about what we do. It'll be a very visual demo. Uh, but then I'll also talk to you about some of the questions that we have, some of the, the concerns that we have. Um, and uh, to the extent that you guys want to talk about it uh, during the session or afterwards, I'm very happy to do so. But this will be kind of a transparent look into, inside of a company and, uh, and, and some of the difficulties that we're facing uh, with our own hardware thoughts. Um, the kind of the, the starting point for the business actually happened about two, three years ago. Uh, I was living in San Francisco at the time. I had spent some time building an e-commerce company here in New York and then working in an e-commerce company on the West Coast. Um, and I was fascinated by this idea that 3D printing would, um, would change the objects in our lives, that we would see more custom objects, we'd see more custom uh, stuff, and that uh, these 3D sensors that I had heard about and stuff like the Microsoft Connect, and I had seen that uh, there were sensors coming out that were moving into our phones and iPads, that, um, that this was going to unleash a whole new set of data about the world, essentially the 3D data in a digitized format of the physical world. And, um, and we looked at all these sensors and we said, uh, for us, if you look at kind of people, places, and things, um, we said, of those uh, choices, what is the easiest thing for us to digitize? Uh, we saw a lot of people going after things. We saw a lot of people looking after people. Um, we saw very few people looking after places. And so we said, um, should we look at the hardware that's on the market? There's a bunch of stuff that's mobile. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff like the device in the center, which is made by a public company called Faro. Um, that's a laser scanner designed for documenting uh, buildings and spaces for architectural purposes. Um, the challenge is that that device costs like $60,000. And if you look at most of the 3D scanners on the market, they start at around 50,000 bucks and they go up. The devices that are sitting on top of the Google self-driving cars are $75,000 scanners. And so we said, well, what if we could actually be inspired by the design of uh, some of those laser scanners, but actually bring down the cost by an order of magnitude, by shipping, uh, pushing a lot of the, uh, the difficult or the hard parts of those problems uh, onto software. And that's actually what we ended up doing. And so uh, I'm going to show you a visual now of one of the very first kind of end-to-end -end completed scans that we do, uh, that we did. Uh, this actually was uh, the interior of the Gracie Mansion, uh, which we scanned in about two hours, uh, right before Mayor Bloomberg actually uh, left the office. Uh, he had restored the mansion to uh, its sort of historical um, uh, Prime and uh, and the new mayor was moving in. A lot of things were changing, and this was a digital record of the sorts. And what I was fascinated by was both how cool it was in terms of the having the three dimensionality. Each of these little points represent a point in space that were then colored by uh, a camera. But I was also struck uh, as we started to try and do stuff with this data as how difficult it was to work with three dimensional data. And this really became um, a core premise of our business was how can we actually reduce the difficulty of working with 3D data. How can we reduce the costs involved in working with 3D? And in the process, there might be a really interesting software business there. And that, uh, if you want to think about Florida as a, as a company, um, you should think about us as a 3D data company. And, and the things that, just to reiterate, what makes 3D data so hard to work with um, is that it's super, the, the data today, so if we look at kind of the framework of um, how, what type of 3D data exists today. Um, you've got 99.9% .9 of the 3D data in the world is generated by people who are making it using 3D modeling programs. They could be architects, they could be product designers, they could be video game makers, but they're all making it by hand. Um, and we said, well, what if there's a world where we could make that data automatically as opposed to manually? And that became kind of an interesting uh, prism. Um, but the challenge is, is that automation is super hard. 
moreover, um, once you have 3D data that exists, whether that data has been automatically generated or manually generated, it's actually really tough for me to get that 3D data to you. Um, you've got the size of these files. Um, you've got the question of whether or not your browser supports the consumption of 3D data. You have the question of, is your graphics card powerful enough to actually render the data that I'm giving to? Um, and then you've got these other issues where it's like, um, you know, we interact with our computers using two-dimensional inputs, mice and keyboards, et cetera. Um, and as you're working with an audience, uh, in our case, our customers are real estate developers, many of whom trend on the more senior side, they've never actually interacted with a piece of 3D content before. They've never played a video game. They've never, uh, you know, had a chance to rotate a 3D model. So you have a, you have a real lack of familiarity uh, with some of these things. And so across distribution uh, creation and then on the application layer, um, 3D data is actually really challenging. And, and what we're hoping to do is to make that data easier to create, easier to consume, and then uh, increase the value of that data via rich applications. Um, on the creation side, I think one of our learnings over the past two years has been you don't necessarily need to 100% automate everything if in the process you can deliver a faster process uh, and or a lower cost. On the distribution side, um, you have to make some choices. You have to decide, uh, sometimes I'm going to be able to deliver you this beautiful 3D model that I'll show you, and sometimes I'm not. And so you have to make some choices about performance versus quality. And then on the application side, um, we've seen that there is a lot of uh, demand for these, uh, for these apps that we're building, in particular around the real estate side. And in some cases, uh, you can train people to how to use this data, and you can build tools that enable them to navigate that data. Um, more easily. Um, but, uh, but what we're hoping to do is map the physical world. Um, and for us, that work comes in two stripes. There's the physical world that exists today, which is around 3D scanning. And then there's the physical world that doesn't yet exist. Uh, in, the, uh, in the building world, this, is, this tends to be new developments, new construction, and remodeling. This is where the use case for 3D renderings have been the strongest in the past. Um, we've tried to build a new way to consume that information. And so I'll show you what that looks like. Um, on the product side, we're doing two things. We're capturing spaces that exist using 3D scanning, and then we're using real-time computer graphics to show spaces that don't yet exist, um, and those could be insides of buildings, outside of the buildings, et cetera. Um, I'm sure you're not surprised, but the majority of the way the real estate industry works is in 2D. Um, we, uh, we have black and white floor plans, which are the dominant communications medium. Uh, we have photographs, some of which are designed to be transparent, some of which are designed to obscure transparency with you. Um, and then you've got a small amount of video that has kind of permeated um, uh, the real estate world. And what we've said is, uh, what if we could create one process where we could create um, a three-dimensional model that would in fact uh, replace all of those things? And so let me show you a little bit about uh, what we do. Um, okay, yeah. can everybody see? All right. So um, first things first, uh, this is what we are trying to extract automatically from something called a 3D scan. So the, the way the 3D scan works is that the tripod is placed inside of the, uh, the building. Um, the, what spins is, a, and I'll, I'll show a hardware diagram in a moment. Um, the laser spins to capture the geometric uh, measurements around the space, and then we capture photographic information as well to help us with the 3D data collection. And what we do is we create a three-dimensional model of the space that you can explore through the web. Uh, this is running um, in the web browser. And what we're trying to do is get to a fast 3D reconstruction that I can walk through and navigate through and have very, very photorealistic uh, materials and, uh, and finishes and fixtures, et cetera. There's very low tolerance um, in, in our customer base around having any artifacts inside that 3D model. And so what we've had to optimize for is, is essentially a clean 3D model, the types of 3D models that someone would, uh, would see if they had actually built this, um, built this model by hand. Um, from, a, uh, from a customer perspective, we often will deliver those models um, furnished, so we'll deliver them with stuff inside of them. So what you'll see uh, here is that um, inside of this space, same exact space, but albeit with a bunch of uh, information that's been added to that space. Uh, and all of these objects, as you'll see in a moment, are actually editable in real time. So whether that's you want to move around uh, a piece of furniture, whether you want to move a light inside of the scene, whether you want to change around a material, all of that's actually now possible in real time. Um, and so let me, uh, let me head back. You guys don't want to see my fantasy football league scores. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about, um, about our process, and then I'll come back to a few other demos. So, um, so what our hardware looks like, oh, 
is that uh, we wanted to make it inexpensive, so that was part one, was uh, at every step along the way, um, we wanted to reduce costs, and a lot of that looked like unbundling the, end of the piece of hardware. And so what it comes down to is that there's actually four components uh, to what we've done. Um, there's a laser range finder. Uh, laser costs about $4,500, and we're hoping that, that over time those costs get driven down, largely because of self-driving cars. Um, there's a camera that delivers uh, really high quality, high dynamic range photography. We use that photography not necessarily to texture the geometry that we see, but instead actually to, uh, to find features inside of the model that helps us with the 3D reconstruction part. Um, there's a motor and then there's an Android tablet. And one of the things that we do differently than the high-end laser scanners is that we actually align all that different data that we see on the Android tablet in locally and in real time. So you can see what it is that you've scanned and you can get a sense for whether when you're on site, whether you've actually completed a full scan. And what we're trying to do with the 3D scans is to take, so that Gracie mentioned those points that I saw, we call it, a, it's called a point cloud. It's a cloud of lots of individual points. So hundreds of thousands, millions of these points can be captured when you actually go out into the field. And we're trying to reconstruct a model that can be used in an architectural process. Um, and that's a lot of hard work. We actually have a guy who, uh, who did his, we, we joke that he did his PhD in Florida when he was at school. He, his work was around extracting architectural models from generic point cloud data. And that process looks like uh, first finding a base, um, then, then uh, doing some feature detection in order to segment uh, columns from windows and, win and walls from floors, etc. Um, we then build up uh, the model by finding single-sided walls versus double-sided walls, um, and then uh, doors, uh, then there's going to be um, wall. So, th so then what we do is we actually complete the walls based on the information that it is that we've seen. Um, we then uh, find columns and beams, and uh, this is all computer vision work uh, for folks of you interested in software engineering. And then what we do is we actually build a semantic model. So this is a model that has uh, knowledge about all the different things that a person sees when we see a room, that we understand that uh, this column holds up this, uh, this ceiling, and if you remove this column, you've got architectural implications, but um, that certain things are movable and certain things are not. Uh, and then from there, we start to extract the 3D. So for any of you who are familiar with an architectural program, this is the represented, representation of it in Grasshopper. Um, and then we build the geometry, and what you get is you get a shell, uh, essentially an architecturally valid, semantic, three-dimensional model from, uh, from a 3D scan uh, that can be imported into any number of architectural programs. And, uh, and then what we're doing is we are, uh, we're, we have a mesh that actually you know, can come from the physical world and you guys can see the comparison between the two. Uh, now, one of the first and major learnings for us uh, after we started down this pipeline um, was actually that we weren't going to be able to get the textures from the real world, from this 3D scanning process, if we wanted to relight a space, if we wanted to move uh, stuff around inside the space. And so we ended up having to uh, go down another pipeline. Uh, so this is building a totally different type of scanner, um, which is designed at capturing materials. So how many of you have ever done any sort of remodeling project where you've gotten a little square of the tile that you're going to get or the wood or a show of hands anybody seen that okay now uh, raise your hands if that process was not annoying to you in the in the process of trying to visualize what that little thing is going to look like inside like your entire kitchen floor it's a leading question but uh, for us it was really annoying that um, that we had to make these decisions from these small uh, from these small tiles and so what we said was uh, what's really important in the 3d world is that you can extract a material that can be applied across an entire floor or an entire ceiling uh, from something like this. And so we said, again, using a very lightweight approach, we actually had uh, a woman from Princeton who was doing her summer internship with us who kind of took this project uh, end to end under her wing. And she built this first prototype and uh, created this really cool video um, of how it works. And what we do is um, we're actually capturing that material that's being lit from every possible perspective inside of the scene. And so why is that important? Well, that's important because it enables us to actually build a, uh, a materials uh, library, uh, a library of a bunch, a bunch of different materials that have actually been scanned in that can now be relit in real time. So what that means is that I can take any one of these materials, uh, I can actually determine what its lighting properties are, what it'll look like under a bunch of different uh, lighting conditions. Let me actually 
It's like a candle light there. Um, and this now goes back into our engine. And when you see in just a second uh, that I can now grab one of these lights, now what happens is that when I unlock the scene and I grab a light and I actually move that light around, I can relight the scene dynamically. So I know how that texture will be relit under a number of different lighting scenarios, all because that material was once originally scanned. So now you see what was this once, this complex idea of getting to a 3D model that I could use in a design process. You see that we've acquired geometry, you know, dimensions from 3D scanning. We've acquired materials from a separate material scanning process. And when you mash it up together, you can actually get to a really cool design application that with a little bit of computer graphics uh, expertise can actually uh, be powered through the web and, uh, and soon to other applications. So this is our uh, a preview of our graphics engine. We call it Luma for light. Um, and everything inside of the scene can be moved in real time. And you'll see that all the shadows, everything will update dynamically. And this is now a viable replacement for the rendering workflow that anyone who owns a space actually undergoes today where if they want to get a rendering done, they have to set, get, receive a model, they have to make a bunch of comments, all those comments go back to the renderer, they set up the lights, they set up the light intensities, they render it, they give them back an image or a video. We're saying now, here's a world where you can actually walk through these spaces, make these changes um, in real time, and, uh, and get to a faster output. And as our hardware gets better, uh, both on the scanning side on, the, on both ends, but also the hardware that we use to access these models, um, we get faster performance, we get better looking performance, um, and all of that uh, serves to move up these very slow processes from the real world. So the final piece of hardware that I'm going to talk about is hopefully one that's on the minds of some of you guys, which is uh, what happens um, when hardware comes that enables us, if we go back to that first point where we're using a 2D interface, I'm using this mouse to interact with this 3D content on my screen, well, what happens when I can actually use a 3D input? And, uh, and in this case, we're super compelled by uh, by the work that Oculus and now Facebook is doing in virtual reality and then also Samsung uh, to do the same thing. So, um, so there what you've got is you've got an interface where you can now sit inside of that 3D model that we're generating from the real world, look around um, and then feel like you're immersively inside the space. So this is obviously not hardware that we build but we essentially create content for a totally new type of input that hopefully many of you guys will get a chance to try in the coming years. All right, I think that's everything. Happy to take any questions that you've got. Actually, I want to show you one more thing. Um, so uh, one of the challenges that we have as a business, um, and there are many of them, um, is that uh, we, what we do right now is um, a very high-end uh, service from end to end to our customer base. And uh, frequently the question comes up, well, is there any faster way that I can get to a 3D model? And so we've just recently started experimenting, and I would love to get anybody's feedback on this, as to what if you can't get into a space, or what if you only have a two-dimensional input? Can you do any of the work that you've done to actually repurpose 3D from 2D? And, uh, and here's our first you know, attempt at it. Uh, it's designed to kind of... Um, uh, echo the hand-drawn sketch feel that a lot of architects start out with when they're just beginning to to take a process. But we did was we uh, we took our engine and we said um, instead of uh, rendering to super photorealistic. Uh, uh, models, can we actually remove the lights, remove the materials, and get to a faster output where this could now be applied to many, many more spaces than what we can do today where the hardware is still a little bit expensive. So uh, if you guys have interest in doing really low cost 3D reconstruction from floor plans, come and talk to me afterwards. This is a product that we call Sketch. Thank you. Yeah, we, so we started uh, a few years ago, um, I was really interested in who was doing like low cost 3D reconstruction and so we started talking with folks who were using the Kinect to do 3D reconstruction and um, ultimately for our purpose, uh, the developers that we were trying to sell to said that the models had to look perfect and in order to look perfect we had to actually go to more expensive hardware than the stuff that's coming into our mobile phones and so it was in that context that we actually decided to build our own. And well, I realize it's a little different part of the market, but any thoughts on the, you know, Google Tango and what's it, Intel, RealSense, like this, this whole concept of uh, uh, 
uh, introducing 3D scanning on mobile phones to that external hardware? Yeah, I think it's going to be very popular for consumers and I think for folks who are willing to relax certain quality assumptions. Um, for the professional who's trying to present a space to sell based off of that data, um, from everything that we've seen, perfect-ish 3D reconstruction is just not going to be that easy from those devices. And so um, I think there'll be different uses for different types of inputs. Great. Questions? Hi, uh, very nice presentation. I'm pretty sure I heard you guys speak around April talking about what you were doing, and it sounded like you were doing a lot with commercial real estate. How's all that going? Are you getting traction with uh, mapping spaces and creating kind of virtual reality um, uh, you know, shows, basically, for people who are looking to, to, to lease space? Yeah, I mean, it's going better than I thought. <laughs> the uh, uh, if you hear me out speaking, I'm, I'm, this is what I, I mean. What I do is I, I sell while the rest of the company builds stuff. So um, we, uh, I think the, the truth is, is that uh, we've been able to find a path to building a self-sustaining, viable business off of that. Uh, on the other hand, there's a ton, way more people that have not adopted anything like this than who have. And so that we have a long road to go to kind of convince people. At the end of the day, for real estate owners, a lot of it comes down to the ROI. And so um, one of the reasons why we trended into the design process was that it was easier to show how speed impacted the ROI there. Um, real estate transactions are these highly complex multi-attribution you know, things. Um, and so, uh, um, where's it going? So, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's going well, but it, as with any new technology, I think it could be going better. And I think uh, the best things for us are just finding the early adopters, building repeatable business with them, and then having them introduce us to their, their friends. Very cool, thank you very much.